So please join me in welcoming its worship, Mayor Mike Hurley, for his State of the City Address. Thank you, Joanne, for that very kind introduction. Uh, our relationship with Simon Fraser has grown and is something to be cherished and something to ensure that we keep alive for a very long time. So thank you for the, and everyone at SFU for the collaboration. I should mention uh, our members of council who have joined us here today before I get going because we have a wonderful team and it takes team to get things done and, and I just want to be sure that I thank each and every member of council uh, because we see it in, in other areas. We were just having a talk uh, about it earlier. That it, that's not always the case. So I'm very fortunate to work with such a wonderful group of councillors. So I'd like to hear a round of applause for them because they're a wonderful team. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, before we start, I too would like to acknowledge that we are in the unceded and traditional territories of the Hunkamanum Squahomish speaking peoples and to extend appreciation for the opportunities to be in this territory. It's wonderful to be here once more for, to deliver the 2024 State of the City Address. This is something I look forward to every year and I'm excited to get underway. I'd like to start by thanking the Burnaby Board of Trade for hosting once again. Burnaby Board of Trade puts on so many fantastic events in our community each year, bringing together leaders from across so many sectors in Burnaby. And it takes a lot of hard work behind the scenes to make events like this a success. Thank you all for taking the time to be here and for continuing to support the Burnaby Board of Trade. But just before I move on, I'd also like to take a moment to personally thank Paul Holden. I'm going to ask Paul to stand and uh, for all the amazing work he's done with the Board of Trade. Paul, you've served this commu community for well over the past 13 years, and it's been a pleasure to work with you. I know that's a sentiment shared by many people in this room, and I want to wish you all the very best in your retirement, and I hope your golf scores come down a lot. So uh, let's hear a big round of applause for Paul. I think a standing ovation is possible. <clears throat> From businesses to community organizations and nonprofits, this room is filled with people who enhance our city. It's great to see Antonia back here today. Antonia does wonderful work with the Burnaby Neighborhood House, which is such a valuable resource in our community. And every May, we celebrate Na Neighborhood House Week, recognizing the incredible work that these, this, these organizations do in communities across Canada. So thank you, Antonia, for joining us, and happy Neighborhood House Week. I could go on, but we have a lot to get to today. To start, I'd like to tell you a little about a, a bit about the great work that's been happening over the last year. From significant advances in public safety, parks and transportation, as well as the completion of a major recreation center. There is so much to talk about. We've also seen some major changes to housing legislation in our province, which will transform not only Burnaby, but cities across BC. And as you might expect, I'll have a little bit to say about that too. But for now, let's jump into some of the highlights of what we have been working on. In the Burnaby Mountain area, we recently completed the first of two new fire stations. Fire Station 4 is located next to Burnaby Mountain Golf Course and we'll be hosting a grand opening for the community next month. It's a beautiful modern facility and will be home to our wildland firefighting equipment and personnel. And later this year, we'll open fire station number eight, the first fire station on Burnaby Mountain. 
These two projects mark a huge increase in emergency response capacity in the Burnaby Mountain area. And as I'm sure you know, the expanded Trans Mountain Tank Farm and Pipeline are both next door. Make no mistake, we oppose that project, but now that it's here, our focus must be on keeping our community safe. And that's where we're at. If you've driven by these new fire stations, you may note they look similar. That's intentional. We duplicated the designs, making it easier to build them fast and at low cost. These are big ticket projects, and we're keenly aware that it's getting more expensive to build in this post-pandemic high interest world. I know this likely rings true for many of you who are here today and attempting to build your own projects. I'm thrilled to share that both projects are coming in on time and on budget. Credit is due to staff who led the projects. And the success can also be attributed to our decision to use the integrated project delivery model. The IPD model gets city staff, designers, and construction team around the same table throughout the projects and incentivize savings. We'll also use this model to build a new RCMP detachment, a project we approved earlier this year. As you may know, we're home to the second largest RCMP detachment in Canada, and just a note, depending on what happens in Surrey and who knows what that is, <laughs> uh, we may become the biggest RCMP detachment. So uh, a new building is long overdue. The current one was built in 1967 as a courthouse. Burnaby's population at that time was 112,000, less than half of what it is today. Suffice to say, the time has come. We're committed to ensuring our first responders have the tools and facilities to keep our community safe. Using the IPD model, I'm confident that we can deliver a facility that provides good value for Burnaby residents while ensuring their safety for generations to come. This year, we also completed a great project at Central Park that is already hugely popular. The Central Park Perimeter Trail is 3.5 kilometers and is one of the longest continuous rubberized tracks in Metro Vancouver. Abundant trees around the route provide shade during the day and is well lit to allow people to enjoy using it later in the evening. It's a great new amenity for the neighborhood and anyone who wants to visit. I encourage you all to check it out and enjoy the natural beauty of one of Burnaby's largest parks. Burnaby's parks also deliver benefits you may not have considered. They absorb heat, helping to keep our neighborhoods cool during heat waves. During periods of heavy rain, they, they help to absorb runoff and protect our homes. They also provide important habitat for Burnaby's flora and fauna. According to our estimates, there are about 630,000 trees in Burnaby. They're a precious resource for our residents, and we recognize the importance of managing them with care. Last year, we started a conversation with residents to develop the, the city's first urban forest management strategy. It will outline how we protect, enhance, and ultimately expand the urban forest in Burnaby. Today, our tree canopy covers about 32% of our city. Our goal is to increase that to 40% by 2050, with an emphasis on parts of our city lacking in tree cover. The strategy will be driven by residents, and we'll be reaching out once again to residents later this year for input, with an aim to bring final draft to council soon. And now I'd like to show you a video. There are plenty of reasons to love living in Burnaby. And if there's one thing we can all agree on, it's that you can't beat the incredible green spaces right here in our city. We're so fortunate to live in a community of diverse landscapes with a broad inlet to the north, Fraser River to the south, and plenty of streams, forests, and even a mountain nestled in between. Burnaby residents cherish these green spaces, and as our community grows, it takes all of us to ensure they're protected and managed for future generations to enjoy. These places 
to play and explore provide incredible value to our residents. There are over 150 parks in our community, and that didn't happen by accident. Years of dedicated planning, effort, and community involvement has ensured that as our city grows, so too does our green space. 25% of our city is parks and conservation land, and that percentage is growing. During the 2022 municipal election, residents overwhelmingly voted to dedicate an additional 205 acres of city-owned land as park. In fact, since 1987, parkland in Burnaby has grown by more than 30%. And new master plan communities are adding more outdoor recreation amenities in our urban centers. But as we look to the future, and as our city densifies, our priority is to enhance and ensure everyone can benefit from green spaces close to home. In the coming years, we'll make improvements to our major parks, including high quality playgrounds for kids, and we're committed to continuing to build our local park system. We know how important it is to have a neighborhood park just a short walk from your home. It makes our city more livable, vibrant, and sustainable. At the city, it's our priority to ensure everyone has a place nearby where they can play, explore the outdoors, and connect. Burnaby's green spaces are a source of pride in our community, and I look forward to watching them grow. Just love that music, huh? <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that little video break. As I mentioned, we have got big plans for our parks this year. We're building four new playgrounds in Burnaby in 2024 at Forest Grove Park, Jim Lorimer Park, Lobley Park, and Poplar Park. And we're also developing plans for a truly one of a kind destination playground at Central Park. This is going to be something really special. The playground will have unique features you won't see at other playgrounds in our region. It will be the first step of a larger transformation in that corner of Central Park, that will ultimately feature a new community plaza and a lawn area, the perfect place to gather and relax. And we're not stopping there. We've committed to building new playgrounds and upgrading our parks in the years ahead. As our city grows, it's so important that people have opportunities to explore, connect, and stay active. When I was here last year, I shared our exciting vision for the future of the BC Parkway. We want to transform this drab corridor into a linear park, a vibrant space lined with art, music places to relax and connect with your neighbors. We have engaged with the community to get their input on what they'd like to see on the BC Parkway. And I'm pleased to share that we've made great progress on designs for this project and I look forward to sharing a draft plan later this year. Last month, we welcomed the community to the brand new Rosemary Brown Recreation Center. On May 11th, we will host a grand opening for the community and we hope to see you all there. This arena is the first in a wave of new community centers coming to our city, which will serve our residents for years to come. It features two NHL-sized rinks, lots of space to sit and stay warm while your kids are on the ice, and meeting rooms for the community and a great rooftop patio. The facility is named in honor of a politician, a social justice champion, Rosemary Brown. Brown was a prominent Burnaby MLA from 1979 to 1986, and was the first black woman elected to a provincial legislature in Canada. She was a pioneer, politician, community leader, and community rights champion who used her voice to fight discrimination against women and other people of color. We're extremely honored to, that her family will be joining us for the grand opening of this fantastic new facility. And last week, City Council also approved the contract to build a new state-of-the-art facility at Burnaby Lake that will include new pools and, an, and a skating rink. Burnaby Lake Rec Recreation Center is a key part of our vision 
for the next generation of recreation centers in our city. This new facility will, be, will include an Olympic-sized competition pool, as well as a second pool for lane swim and lazy river for people of all ages to have fun. As well, there will be an NHL-sized rink to help meet the huge demand for ice time. And what really stands out to me is the way this facility will be a major anchor at Burnaby Lake, which make no mistake, will become one of the premier sports complexes in BC. As you can see, over the next five years, we've got some big projects on the go. Burnaby Lake Recreation Complex, Cameron Community Centre, and the construction of a new RCMP building, among others. These projects will be funded through the city's reserves, meaning there will be no additional burden placed on taxpayers. I had a few questions about taxes, and we'll get to those. Had we tried to fund them the way most cities do? By borrowing. The 2024 property tax increase would have been set at 7.5%. Instead, our property tax increase this year is 4.5%, the lowest in the region. And if you look to our neighbours, you'll see more like 7, 8, 9%. So uh, we're doing our job. Also using our reserves, we've kept our water and sewer rate increases low. And I think we don't get enough credit for this year after year because we keep it really low, these increases. If we had passed along the increases that we got from Metro Vancouver, as most cities do, residents would be paying 7.6 more for water and almost 29% more for sewer. Instead, thanks to the strength of our reserve funds, we are able to hold the line on water with no increase to that rate and keeping our sewer increases to 5% this year. Now, I know there are many mathematicians out there, so I hope you're figuring all this out. That Burnaby actually is a really good deal. For a long time, Burnaby has shown leadership through its fiscal strength, raising funds through development to deliver great facilities and ease the burden on the taxpayer. In recent years, we've also led in the area of housing. Since the Mayor's Task Force on Community Housing 2019, we worked hand in hand with the community. I want you to note that word, hand in hand with the community, to develop innovative housing policies and programs. It takes time to shift the dial on housing. But I can tell you our approach is starting to pay off. Over the last five years, we have created more than a thousand new units of non-market housing. These units are offered at varying levels of rent, ensuring that people from all walks of life can call Burnaby home. And in recent months, things have really started ramping up. And I'm pleased to add that after decades of almost no rentals being built in Burnaby, there are currently more than 19,000 rental units across all stages of the development process in our city. In fact, our progressive housing policies have been so successful that other cities are now adapting our approach. The point I'm trying to make here is, when you reach out to the public, work together to develop solutions, you get success. And that's how you build effective policy. You work with the community, with residents, with businesses, and all the various groups to craft solutions that benefit everyone. That's the process we're following right now as we do a major update to Burnaby's official community plan. The OCP, of course, is the guiding document for our city, and we're taking the time to do it right. We're about two years in, and we're only halfway through. The city has hosted more than a dozen events and received more than 20,000 comments from the public. We've even worked once again with SFU's Wask Centre for Dialogue to facilitate a Burnaby Community Assembly as an additional layer of public feedback for the OCP process. A group of 45 residents is gathering over a six-month period to grapple with topics such as land use, transportation, housing, the environment, community facilities, services, and economic planning. The recommendations will be just one of the many sources of input into the new OCP. This is how you engage the community 
about issues that matter. Our approach stands in stark contrast to how we're being treated by the provincial government. And recent changes to provincial housing legislation puts our success at risk. Rather than recognizing our Made in Burnaby model, is, which is working very effectively, the province is making the largest change to BC to municipal zoning in BC's history. It's a sea change, make no mistake. <clears throat> Around SkyTrain stations, the province has set minimum building heights based on whether it's 200, 400, or 800 meters from the station. Now, I want you to think about this. Are all SkyTrain stations created equally? Should we be doing a blanket approach? Because if you look at SkyTrain stations in Burnaby, we have already done massive developments around them. To add to that, in my view, is just not right. Their stated goal is to improve affordability by building a lot more housing. The ironic, the ironic thing in Burnaby, it will actually do the opposite. Their one-size-fits-all blanket approach will punish cities like Burnaby that were overperforming and will hamper our ability to build more housing. To date, Burnaby has had a very well-balanced approach. Our growth was focused in our four town centers where we offered densities that far exceeded what the province envisions. The province is changing zoning and in doing so, will push high density out of our town centers and into anywhere within 800 meters of a SkyTrain station. I don't see anything or anyone part of these changes improving affordability which is supposed to be the stated goal. It's not a housing crisis, it's affordability crisis. And none of this legislation outside of what they've copied from us will work. The only two things in the provincial legislation that will really make a difference for people were actually cut and pasted from the city of Burnaby. The province is introducing tenant assistance provisions which are modeled after our tenant assistance policy. And they are also in introducing inclusionary zoning, which gives cities the ability to require to develop, require developers to include up to 20% of the units in the new developments at below market rentals. I'm going on at length a bit on these provincial changes because a lot of people in the community don't know what's coming and that this is being imposed on us by the province. And many people aren't aware how significant these changes will be to the character of our city. What I can promise you, though, is that we're working hard to ensure that, regardless of the changes, Burnaby will continue to prosper and to thrive. On that note, I'm pleased to see our local film industry bouncing back after a difficult couple of years. As you may know, 2023 in particular, presented challenges for the film industry around the globe. Actors and writer strikes led to work stoppages and slowdown across the board. And while we're glad to see the workers reach a fair settlement, it's also important to assure that one of Burnaby's key industries continues to grow. We've said it before on this stage, but Burnaby is truly the heart of Hollywood North. I'm encouraged to see many productions picking up at our many stages and studios across the community. We have a wealth of studio space and technical talent. In fact, Burnaby is home to more than 50% of BC's sound stages, and more are on their way. Bridge Studio was nearing completion, a facility at Lake City that will be the largest film television production studio in Canada. That makes us uniquely suited to weather the downturns that will happen in any industry. And it also means we're in prime position to capitalize on the return to full production in the months ahead. It's always great to see Burnaby in the background of shots from major blockbusters and hit TV shows. But the important thing to me is that this industry continues to provide good, high paying jobs to our residents. And that's why we're also committed to supporting the growth of Burnaby's high tech hub. For decades, the Technology Centre has been an important driver of Burnaby's local economy. And over the last few years, we've seen more 
and more companies choosing to, to come to Burnaby to expand their businesses or to launch their operations. I recently had the opportunity to tour the Tersa Earth Innovations Facility. This Burnaby-based startup is transforming the mining industry by turning environmental risks into high-value assets. Their groundbreaking technology not only mitigates the harmful impacts of mining, but also has the potential to recover precious metals from the waste. It's a technologic, technology sorry, with huge potential to address the risks related to tailing ponds, which are common across mining communities in Canada. This sustainable approach not only supports our environmental goals, but also boosts our local economy. I'm excited to see this technology continue to develop in our own backyard, and I hope you keep an eye on the innovations happening right here in our city. Another way we can support our industry and business communities is to ensure our transportation systems are prepared to meet the demands of the 21st century. Three years ago, we adopted Connecting Burnaby, a comprehensive plan for the future of transportation in our city. It's a long-term vision looking 30 years into the future. And we're already seeing some results from the strategy. And last winter, the Mayor's Council on Regional Transportation announced that the Metrotown to North Shore route has been selected as a priority for the region's first rapid transit routes. For those unfamiliar with the term rapid bus transit, it refers to high frequency rapid transit system. Buses operate on routes with dedicated lanes and enhanced stations. And they also have signal priority, making service even faster and more reliable. This project will help reduce congestion and improve the access to employment, education, and recreation opportunities for residents on both sides of the Burrard Inlet. I look forward to seeing it advance. We're also upgrading our cycling networks and infrastructure to keep up with demand. Last year, we launched phase one of the Edmonds Town Center Cycling Improvement Project. We built neighborhood bikeways and corridors using quick build methods to give folks a chance to get out and ride. We got a lot of valuable feedback from the first phase of this project, and the second phase is now underway with an aim to have more cycling routes ready to test out this summer. Of course, our cycling improvements aren't just limited to Edmonds. In North Burnaby, work continues on the Vancouver to SFU bikeway, which will help make this vibrant area even more lively. You may not have heard, you may have heard, not have heard, because it's not the type of news to make the headlines. But last year, we installed 50 new bus shelters across Burnaby. On the rare occasion that it rains in Burnaby, I know it's nice to be able to duck under cover as you wait for the bus. It's one way of making it a little easier and safer to take transit. We're not stopping at 50 though, and this year we plan to install another 50 bus shelters. And uh, you know, that's so important, I think, as we encourage different modes of transportation. There's one final project that I'd like to talk about, one that I'm quite excited about, and that is the Burnaby District Energy Utility. This project will not only address our climate change goals, it will also deliver cost savings to businesses and residents. As you may know, Burnaby is home to Metro Vancouver's, Van Metro Vancouver's waste to energy facility, where we burn about a quarter of the region's garbage. Every day, a huge amount of heat produced goes to waste. And currently, only 25% of the energy produced by this facility is utilized, a staggering waste of potential. However, with a district energy system, we can increase the efficiency of the incinerator to an impressive 75%. <clears throat> it's a unique opportunity. No other big city in, no other big city in Canada has this kind of untapped potential energy sitting in their backyard. The premise is simple. The heat from the waste to energy facility is captured. Through a network of connected underground pipes, the energy is then delivered to buildings for heating, cooling, and domestic hot water heating. District energy is a versatile proven technologies 
used in cities across the world. Rather than each building having its own furnace, or boilers, a district energy system can provide thermal, thermal energy to, to multiple buildings or even entire neighborhoods through a central energy plant. The first phase will connect to Vancouver's River District and here in Burnaby will extend the pipe network to Metrotown and Edmonds area as part of phase two of the project. Already, new building applications for these two neighborhoods must ensure they are district energy ready. Ultimately, we see the potential for a district energy system to reduce our carbon emissions by up to 85%. We know this is possible because we've already seen the success of a district energy system at SFU. Their biomass energy center, which operated, which opened, sorry, just a couple of years ago, has already achieved the 85% reduction that we're targeting. This is really impressive technology, but the bright minds at SFU are looking for even more ways to improve the efficiency of district energy. And that's why I'm excited to share that we're part partnering with SFU on a pilot project designed by Dr. Mahid Bakrama, an engineering professor at SFU. Dr. Bakrama's technology has the potential to further improve the efficiency of a district energy system through advanced heat storage systems and heat pumps. It's quite amazing to, to see what they're doing up there. This connection is possible thanks to the partnership between SFU and the city of Burnaby, known as the Civic Innovation Lab. Co-founded in 2022, the lab is designed to harness the research capacity and expertise at SFU and seek ways to use that knowledge to benefit our community. I think this district energy pilot project is a great example of that research in action. But the lab also supports a wide variety of projects that you may have already heard about. From looking at ways to improve the ecosystem at Deer Lake Park to engaging our residents in community-led climate action initiatives. The Civic Innovation Lab is paying dividends for Burnaby residents. These are exciting projects, and we look forward to sharing more about it in the coming months. Building a complete community doesn't happen overnight. It happens over the course of many, many nights. It takes hard work, planning, and the collective will of our community. I'm inspired by the people here in this room who work every day to build Burnaby into the great community it is. Whether you do business here or you live here, we want you to feel invested in this community. It's a great sign that two years in a row we've had a capacity crowd to listen to this speech. Now, I'd like to credit my star appeal, uh, but I think the reality is that we do have a really tight community and a caring community in Burnaby, and that's really why you're all here. Burnaby is a city that's coming into its own. I can't thank the Burnaby Board of Trade enough for helping to bring this room of entrepreneurs and local leaders together. Delivering this address is something I look forward to each year, and I hope you enjoyed yourselves and maybe even learned something new. Thank you all once again one last time for joining us, and thank you so much for the opportunity to speak all of you. It truly is a privilege. Thank you. Thank you.